Welcome viewers to my review of the LegalZoom Internet Will and Trust Preparation Service. My name is Richard Land. I'm an attorney and a member of the Danbury, Connecticut law firm known as Chipman Mizuko. This introduction is a summary of the complete detailed review which will follow in more than one part. First, keep in mind that I'm not affiliated with LegalZoom in any way. Also, I'm not associated in any way with any lawsuits against LegalZoom. I'm an attorney who has been involved in computerized document assembly systems since the 1980s. I've written several estate planning systems myself, and I decided to review LegalZoom merely because I'm interested in the topic. If time permits, I intend to review the other best-selling do-it-yourself systems. LegalZoom is my first. Let me start with a summary in case you don't have the 30 minutes or so to watch the full review. First, the LegalZoom site is well organized and easy to navigate. Second, LegalZoom provides access to some good, easy to understand basic information about wills and trusts. When evaluating LegalZoom, however, keep in mind that similar information is available online for free. Third, Although LegalZoom is less expensive than what you would pay an estate planning attorney, it's not cheap. I paid $349 for an estate planning bundle. That's a lot to pay if there's a risk it will not give me what I need. Fourth, LegalZoom's terms of service and terms of use agreements say that if something goes wrong, I accept the risk and my beneficiaries and I will have no recourse against LegalZoom. LegalZoom accepts no responsibility. Fifth, LegalZoom frequently prompts the user to make decisions about questions before the user has sufficient information on which to base his or her decisions. This creates a significant risk of misunderstandings and mistakes. Sixth, LegalZoom offers very little guidance regarding tax planning. Seventh, I've been asked whether LegalZoom is appropriate for the average Joe. It may be, but there's no procedure for separating customers who might be the average Joe from those who are not. There's no effort to probe with follow-up questions to, to, or to alert the customer to problems. In my experience, the average Joe is rare. The failure to probe deeper into the customer's situation and to make an effort to alert the customer to problems is, in my opinion, a serious defect and creates a significant risk of unintended and unfortunate results. If you stay with this review long enough, you'll see many examples of this defect. I hope the review helps you. Here it is. It's Saturday, June 18th, 2016 at 6.30 in the morning when I first go to LegalZoom.com. This is the welcoming page. It looks good. It's well organized. And I'm looking for an estate planning service that I can use to prepare a will in living trust. I click on Wills and Trusts to see what happens, and under Wills and Trusts I have eight options to select from, and you can see them here. I can select a will, a living trust, and a variety of other documents. I select all estate planning documents. In the next screen we see a short description of what each service means. I'm an attorney, so I'm familiar with the subject matter, and I know exactly what I want. But I do wonder whether someone who is less familiar with the subject matter really gets enough information here. With not much more information, I'll be asked to select a service and the fee for the service. Do I really have enough information to do that? As I scroll down, I see that I can get a bundle of services which will save some money. I see invitations to ask specialists some questions. I decide I'll get to that later, noting, however, that the LegalZoom agents are based in California and Texas, both community property states. I'm in Connecticut, which is a common law state. I can't help but wonder how much the California and Texas agents know about Connecticut law. In any event, the bundle makes the most sense for me, so I ask for the details. I'm introduced to the LegalZoom pricing. In this review, I'm not that interested in the price. I'm more interested in quality, so I pass by the pricing sections quickly. I select the estate plan bundle with a living trust, and I'm faced with some questions. LegalZoom is asking me whether I want a will or living trust for one person or two. I believe most attorneys who practice estate planning would consider this to be putting the cart before the horse. 
I might take an hour, an hour and a half with a client talking to them about their needs and the advantages and disadvantages of a living trust before the client has enough information to make this decision. But here the client is prompted up front to decide without the foundation needed to make the decision. Based on that decision, LegalZoom gives me the price information. Next comes a series of questions prompting for information that you'd expect. It's simple and straightforward. Name and address type information and nothing remarkable. When I've answered the basic questions, I'm given the option to pay in one lump sum or in installments. I'm also prompted for payment information. And I'm provided with a description of how the bundle works. I'm struck by item number three in the description, which LegalZoom calls its peace of mind review. So I click on that to see what the peace of mind review is all about. It appears that the peace of mind review is very limited. LegalZoom says it's checking only to make certain that I provide all the necessary answers to its questions and to correct spelling and punctuation and pagination and to eliminate blank spaces and to make sure I use complete words. It is, in effect, a review of the cosmetic and superficial details, which, although important, can't provide any peace of mind about the substance of the plan. After I study the peace of mind review, I'm prompted to agree to certain terms. Like all computer applications, when I click on the terms of service, I see a great deal of fine print. I'll skip through that here, except to say that whatever peace of mind I may have had is wiped away by the terms of service contract, which in effect says the user, that's you and I, are on our own. LegalZoom is not practicing law. Rather, the user, that's you and I, are representing ourselves, and if something goes wrong, LegalZoom accepts no responsibility. It hasn't taken too long to get through the preliminaries if I don't read the terms of service contracts and if I don't read the resources on wills and living trusts. I have now received my order confirmation and I'm prompted to schedule my attorney consultation. I've decided to wait until the end for my consultation, so I'm going to dive right in and start creating my documents. LegalZoom takes me to a page where the documents I'm entitled to are listed. I signed up for a bundle of estate planning documents for two people, so the list shows me two powers of attorney, two living wills, and one living trust. My last will and testament is not on the list. That's puzzling because I believe that's part of the bundle. I see at the bottom of the list a warning that if I want to change from a living trust plan to a last will and testament plan, I should do it now before I prepare any of the documents. So far, I've not been given much information on which to base such a decision. I could schedule my consultation with an attorney now, but I'm eager to get started. So I click on the button that says I want to finish my living trust, and I'll take advantage of my consultation later. The next page takes me to an explanation of what comes next. Basically, a series of questions to provide LegalZoom with the answers needed to prepare the living trust. I'm told the process could take as little as 30 minutes. I'm assured I can call a specialist at any time during the process. I click on continue with the expectation that it's about to get interesting. In the first question, it appears that LegalZoom is allowing me to create a trust with another person, not just by me. In other words, I can be the only one contributing property to the trust, or I can create a joint trust with another person who also contributes property to the trust. There are many reasons why I, in my own estate planning practice, have avoided joint trusts. Much has been written on the topic by many well-respected legal minds, and attorneys have different views. And much depends on which state's law applies. Joint trusts are more common in community property states. For a number of historical and tax reasons, they're less common in common law states like my state of Connecticut. Whether the client will achieve his or her desired result with a joint trust usually will depend on many factors, including the size of the estate, 
how the trust is managed after it's established, which state's law applies, and how beneficiary designations for life insurance and retirement accounts are handled. As we go on, I'll be on the lookout to see if LegalZoom deals with the possible issues. In any event, I'll take the course I know best, the one I consider low risk, and I answer that I am the only one creating the trust. Once again, LegalZoom asked me for my personal information. I gave this to LegalZoom before, so I won't bore you by going through it again. I'd been at it for a while, and I wanted to take a break, so I searched everywhere in the screen for a save and logout button, but I didn't find one. I ultimately closed out while a little concerned that some information might be lost. When I returned, however, I had no trouble logging in, and I was relieved to find out that no information had been lost. I immediately go to the questions about my wife and children. I provide their names, and I am expecting some follow-up questions about them, but the follow-up questions never come. At this point, an estate planning attorney would gather as much information as possible about the family. Has the client or the client's wife been married before? Is there a prenuptial agreement? Are there obligations under a divorce settlement? Does the client or his wife have children from a prior marriage? Is the client concerned about the possibility that his wife may remarry? Does the client want to know about ways to make certain that his wife will not direct assets to a new husband? Does the client's wife have any health concerns? Are there concerns related to the costs of long-term care? Are there any other important issues that may affect how the client's wife will receive her inheritance? That's quite a long list, and I've only scratched the surface. The answers can make a big difference in how the documents should be prepared and whether the assets eventually go to unintended beneficiaries. An estate planning attorney normally would explore similar issues related to the children. Does any child have a great deal of debt? Is a child involved in a risky occupation? Is the child's marriage on the rocks? The estate planning documents can be prepared to protect the assets from such risks. LegalZoom didn't even ask for the ages of my children. Or, does the child have special needs or health problems including addictions? The estate planning documents can be prepared to deal with such things, but not if the problems are not disclosed to an attorney who knows how to deal with them. In my opinion, LegalZoom's failure to ask the questions and to alert the client to the possible solutions creates a significant risk of unintended and unfortunate results. I'll skip through the where do you live questions which takes us to assets. Here LegalZoom is going to ask me what property I want to put in the trust. What happens now is a bit tedious and will probably test the client's patience. First I'm asked to check off the types of property that I have there are help buttons which give me definitions for each type. The type of property the client owns is very important to an estate planning attorney, and it's important for the client to appreciate the differences. There's not enough time, and you probably won't have enough patience for detailed explanation, but retirement account property is a very good example. Such property is subject to a complicated set of income tax rules. If the retirement account property is payable to the wrong type of trust, the income tax consequences can be severe. So I click on the Help button next to Retirement Account Property to see what LegalZoom has to say about it. I'm pleased to see that the Help button warns that there may be income tax consequences. I believe, however, that given the potentially severe result, LegalZoom should emphasize the problem, especially if the trust is not properly designed to deal with the tax problem. I'm looking forward to seeing the trust agreement that LegalZoom will prepare for me to see how they handle income tax issues related to making the trust the beneficiary of the retirement funds. LegalZoom then asks me for specific information to identify every asset in the different categories. I note that LegalZoom never asks for values. This brings up an important part of any estate plan. Part of the planning relates to cash needs. Will there be sufficient cash to pay debts 
expenses, including funeral expenses, taxes, and any cash gifts you want to make to beneficiaries. So far, LegalZoom has offered no guidance of that kind, and it really can't be of any help anyway if the values are being ignored and how readily assets can be converted to cash is ignored. Now that I've given LegalZoom a detailed picture of the kinds of property I own and each account I own, LegalZoom asked me to identify my beneficiaries and the property that each beneficiary will get. LegalZoom tells me that I can make specific gifts by identifying specific property to go to a particular beneficiary, or I can make charitable gifts by which LegalZoom means a gift of a sum of cash to a charity, or I can make general gifts by which LegalZoom means all or a portion of what is left after satisfaction of specific and charitable gifts. The first question LegalZoom asks me is whether I want to give all assets remaining after specific and charitable gifts to my spouse. I've already covered how the answer to this question might be affected by considerations related to my spouse's health and the likelihood that my spouse might leave the assets to people who are not my beneficiaries. And I already pointed out other relevant issues, so I won't repeat them here. I decide to answer no to see how LegalZoom handles it. LegalZoom then asked me if I want all the trust property remaining after specific and charitable gifts to go to my children. I answer no because I have in mind something that gives part to my spouse and part to my children. Then LegalZoom asked me to identify the beneficiaries and what percentage each one will receive. I believe LegalZoom has some important problems with this approach. First, LegalZoom is asking me to dispose of what is left after specific and charitable gifts. Wouldn't it make more sense first to ask about specific and charitable gifts and then deal with what's left over? Maybe that's the case, but I'll continue on to see what happens. The next question asks me to identify who will receive my property. LegalZoom prompts me for percentages and the identities of recipients and alternate recipients. I answer by saying that I want my spouse to receive 50% and each of my children to receive 25%. I answer that I want the children of a deceased beneficiary to receive the deceased beneficiary's share. I have my misgivings about how this will look in the document that I'll receive, but I decide to withhold judgment until I get the document. One problem with this whole process is that when I answer a question, I have no way of seeing how the document will be affected by my answer. It seems to me that LegalZoom could have a document preview tab where I could see the document as it's being changed with each answer. Next, LegalZoom asks me about specific gifts and charitable gifts. I want to see how LegalZoom handles it, so I say I want to include a specific gift. I describe the specific gift as baseball memorabilia and I say that I want to give that to my son. The next question is whether I want any gifts held in a subtrust. As an aside, I'd like you to know that I originally answered no to this question by mistake. Later, after I finished the interview, I decided that I should answer yes so I could see what LegalZoom gives me. I had no problem logging back in and retracing the questions so that I could change my answer. That's a good thing. It's nice to know you can change answers even after you complete the interview. But that's just an interesting aside. Let's talk about the actual question about subtrusts. I believe most people will be thrown by the term subtrust. The short explanation with the question does not shed much light on the meaning. Anyway. During my second time through the interview, I answered yes to this question. The follow-up question was, when would I want the subtrust to terminate? My selections were ages of the beneficiary to age 50. The option after age 50 was life. In other words, if I answered age 35, the trust would terminate when the beneficiary is age 35. If I answer life, I assume the trust will terminate at the death of the beneficiary. It seems to me that there's a risk of providing an answer that's inconsistent with the actual facts. For example, LegalZoom did not ask for the ages of my children. If my children are over age 35, 
then answering the question about subtrust terminating at age 35 is inconsistent. Maybe LegalZoom has a way to draft around that. We'll see when we get the documents. The explanation for the subtrust says that the subtrust could be used for health, education, and support of the beneficiary. That's a commonly used standard, but it can be a very bad idea for many situations. Language like that could disqualify the beneficiary from certain public assistance and certain types of scholarships based on need. Whether this might be a problem depends entirely on how the terms of the subtrust are drafted. I'll keep my eyes open for that issue when I get the documents from LegalZoom. One problem I'm having with the subtrust question is that I doubt the normal LegalZoom customer will have a clear enough understanding of what a trust is to answer these questions thoughtfully. Most estate planners will spend quite a bit of time with clients explaining what a trust is, how it works, and what the role of the trustee is. That type of dialogue is missing here. Next I'm asked if I want LegalZoom to prepare a will. I can't think of a situation when the client should answer no. It seems to me that the client should always have a will, so I answer yes. The remaining questions are to identify who will carry out the instructions that are in the trust agreement and will. They're referred to as executors, trustees, and guardians. LegalZoom then asks if I want to appoint a co-trustee of my living trust. I answer yes, but once again, I wonder if the typical LegalZoom customer has any idea what this means. If I name a co-trustee, will he or she be involved in every decision I make? How does that work? Then LegalZoom asks me to name the trustee. There are a lot of things to think about when selecting a trustee. Is the person honest and fair? Does a person have knowledge and experience in legal, tax, investment, and accounting matters? Is the person sufficiently intelligent to appreciate the issues involved in managing a trust? Do the beneficiaries respect and look up to the person you are naming as trustee? Is the person physically able to perform the duties of the trustee? Does the person have the time to perform the duties of the trustee? Will the trustee be attentive to the needs of the beneficiary? Is the proposed trustee organized and persistent? Will the person actually get things done? Is the proposed trustee emotionally stable? Does the proposed trustee have good judgment? There's so many things to think about, and the same types of questions apply to the appointment of an executor. The guardianship for your minor children involves different questions. Does the proposed guardian have values regarding child rearing that are similar to yours? Is he or she emotionally stable? Does the proposed guardian have a strong nurturing relationship with your child? Does he or she have good judgment? Does he or she have a healthy relationship with others? Does the proposed guardian have enough time for the job? The proposed guardian's health is also a consideration. And there's more to consider. It's a very rare case when a parent has a perfect selection available, but it is important to talk to the client about these types of things. LegalZoom seems to offer very little help with this type of guidance. LegalZoom then offers its customers the opportunity to get creative and include instructions drafted by the LegalZoom customer. This strikes me as especially dangerous. The peace of mind review may correct whatever mistakes the LegalZoom customer may make in such instructions, but the peace of mind review is not described as doing so. That's pretty much the whole process. At the end, LegalZoom says, I've saved $501 by using LegalZoom. I guess there are different ways to look at that. Based on the interview I just finished, it seems to me that I paid $349 for documents I have not yet seen that are the result of a process with quite a few flaws and with significant risks of mistake. My contract with LegalZoom says LegalZoom's not responsible for mistakes. So at this point, I'm not certain I've achieved anything for the $349 I just spent, and I've assumed all the risks. By the way, I started at around 6.30 in the morning. When I finished, it was close to 8.30, so I devoted two hours to the process. LegalZoom tells me I can expect my documents by June 24th, which is six days later. On June 25th, I'm eager to receive my documents, so I want to check the status of the order. 
It's easy to go to LegalZoom status of order page, so I go there and discover that the estimated delivery date is now later, anywhere from June 27 to July 3rd, instead of the original estimate of June 24 to June 30. On July 4th, I once again visited the status order page. I've discovered that my order is on hold and that I must call LegalZoom to resolve the problem. I also learned that the previous delay resulted from me clicking on this revise link. When I do that, I reset the peace of mind review clock, so I'll be sure not to click on that link again. I suspect that the hold on my plan is the result of me indicating that the share of a deceased child should pass to the deceased child's children, or maybe it's from an instruction to the trustee that I included regarding the disposition of my remains. I would included that to see how LegalZoom would handle it. I'll let you know the outcome after I contact LegalZoom. That's all for now. I'll be finishing this review in a separate video, which will be part two. I'll complete part two when I've received the will and living trust that LegalZoom is preparing for me. I plan to look them over and to then take advantage of my 30-minute attorney consultation after I put together a fairly complete list of questions. In the meantime, you may be interested in the videos listed in this slide, which I've posted to YouTube. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.